All right, good morning. And welcome to our first and to your first session at KubeCon uh, North America 2021 in Los Angeles. Uh, my name is Archie. I'm CNCF ambassador from Canada. I will be a host track. Please welcome our speakers, uh, Katrina Gray, uh, SIG lead uh, and track chair for SIG CLI. She is also software engineer at uh, Apple. Uh, and we have uh, Jeff Reagan, software staff engineer at Tesla. Uh, though they are um, customized contributors. <clears throat> so please welcome them uh, at uh, uh, our first talk. Uh, OK, hello. Uh, quick uh, housekeeping hello. items. Um, at the end of the session, you may raise your hand and ask your question. I'll be running around with microphone and uh, helping uh, to answer the questions. If you're watching us online, you can also submit your questions uh, uh, in the Q&A box, and we'll make sure uh, your question is answered. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. OK, so I'm Jeff, and this is Katrina. We're going to talk about customizing, customize with custom uh, resources. Uh, thanks to the CNCF for bringing us all here. Today. I'm really glad to be at a live event this time around. Uh, the talk's going to have three sections. We're going to talk about what is customized, at least in the context of extending it. Uh, it's not going to be an introduction. Um, then we're going to go into talking about how you would use custom uh, client-side custom resources to do this extension, and then go into the nuts and bolts of that. So first, let me review what customize is, so we can talk about extending it. It's three things. Uh, it's a command line utility, a freestanding YAML editor that knows about Kubernetes. It is a set of Go modules, right? And it is also a command in kubectl. So back in late 2009, or early 2019, late 2018, uh, Brian Grant, Phil Wittrock, and others noticed that there were many missing features, outstanding issues in kubectl that kind of centered around doing edits to the client side data, either edits or creating data, as opposed to what kubectl normally does, which is edit the uh, live cluster. So we wanted to fix or provide a fix for these features, but it was complicated. We felt it was kind of big, so we decided to do it outside of the contents of kubectl um, because we figured we'd probably throw away a few versions. So this resulted in some modules, which are now called by customizers which is relatively thin uh, CLI, and the same modules are called by kubectl. So uh, customizes configuration stream editor, works with Kubernetes YAML, as I just said. It's also very good with working with variants. Now, everybody has multiple environments, uh, multiple clusters, multiple namespaces, maybe multiple namespaces and clusters. And customize is really good at expressing the differences between these different environments. So if you've got production, staging, and uh, development, and they all share like 90% of it in common, customize allows you to succinctly describe the differences between these different environments. And it plays nice with Git. So it can read information from Git, and you're encouraged to write the information back into a Git repository. And it can be extended, which is what the core of this talk is going to be. So what are the guiding principles when you're thinking about customize and thinking about writing extensions? First, um, configuration is at rest. It's just data. It should be directly usable by Kubernetes. So we eschew uh, templating. We eschew uh, domain-specific languages. We just want to see Kubernetes YAML. Um, second, edits or generating um, YAML should be done. Uh, that, that operation should be described itself using Kubernetes YAML. So no matter where you look, you see Kubernetes YAML. Uh, whoops, skip the slide there. Um, this seems to be aggressive. Not too close. <laughs> OK, um, so this is an example of a layout for um, a very simple customized uh, situation where you've got three, um, you've got a three uh, normal Kubernetes files. You want to make edits to them. You, you can edit them with VI or Emacs or whatever. Or you can drop a customization file in there to describe the edits that you'd like to perform. And this makes sense in, in many different contexts, which we're not going to go into today. Um, the customization file is the center file on this screen. It's saying add a name prefix, add some labels, uh, do it to the service.yaml file so that the service.yaml file on the left 
comes out standard out looking like the, uh, on the left, your left, comes out looking like the uh, file on the right. So you invoke this by writing customize build, and then the path to the folder that has the customization file in it. Um, there's no, there's other flags you can apply here. Um, the flags don't affect the output. Um, the only thing that does affect the output is the, uh, you can have a flag that says, put the output into a bunch of individual files, one per resource with names that are generated from the resources kind and uh, name. Um, normally though, you can just pipe it to standard out. And when you're doing development, you can pipe it directly into your um, kind cluster, your Kubernetes in Docker cluster that's running on your laptop. You'd never do that in production though. So what we have is customized orchestrating transformers. It reads YAML from disk, it runs generators to create more YAML, feeds all that YAML into a pipeline of transformers, and some of those transformers are listed up on the right there. You've got a, a, a patch transformer for, you can do JSON patching, you can do strategic merge patching, you can change the namespace, modify the names, add labels, annotations, and whatnot. So, um, getting down into how we're going to extend customize, here are two customizations files that do exactly the same thing. On the left is a short customization file with one field in it that actually does stuff. It's the name prefix field. And it says, add a name prefix, Bob hyphen. And that's gonna add that name prefix to all of the resources in the view of the customization in its, in its purview. On the right, there's no name prefix field, there's a transformers field. And that has a list of transformer specifications. There's only one of them there. There's only one transformer there. It's the prefix suffix transformer. And there's a prefix field that says Bob hyphen. And there's a field spec that says modify the data that's in the field that's at the JSON path metadata name. Now, who's at, whoever owns this customization file could add more fields there and thus uh, have Bob added to the value in those fields. They could also add kind specifications to limit the transformation to only apply to say deployments or cron jobs and, and leave ingress and, and uh, services alone. So you get the full power by using the specification on the right, it's just more verbose. So 90% of the time people are gonna use the thing on the left. But this is the pathway to expansion. So on the left you see the same thing again, that's the prefix suffix transformer. Um, it represents, there's a chunk of code specified there and there's how do you configure that chunk of code to run? And on the right, there's a proposed uh, custom resource that's doing the same thing. It's specifying a chunk of code, in this case, a containerized image, and there's gonna be data in that uh, custom resource spec telling that image, telling that uh, code what to do. So it's helpful for us, it's helpful for me anyway, to think about how, uh, what problems we're gonna solve and we, with custom resources or extensions, and we put those into three different categories. One is generation, and then transformation and validation. With generation, you might take a, you might wanna create a config map from a basic EMV file. You might wanna create a Kubernetes secret by uh, exchanging your uh, single sign-on token for some passwords that you're pulling from HashiCorp Vault. Or you might want to do something really fancy, generate a bunch of things, ingress service deployments for a, Java, a set of Java microservices in a Spring, Spring Boot environment. If you're customizing your uh, transformations and you're working, you're, you're developing your own, say, uh, server-side custom resources, and let's say you're, you haven't debugged your reconciliation very well and you need to make sure that you apply things to the cluster in the order that you like, you might write a client-side reordering function to just actually not modify the, trans the, uh, the individual resources, but actually change the order in which they appear in the YAML stream. And then finally, you might want to do a validator. Uh, this is like a transformer that doesn't do any transformation. It just simply fails with good error messages telling you what you've done. This might be a way to say, constrain the number of replicas to some bound. Okay, so this slide is meant to trigger just ideas about the kinds of extensions you might want to write. Um, there's also the things you could do. You could generate from Helm, you could write sidecar generators, etc. And uh, now Katrina is going to talk about the whys and wherefores. Thanks, Jeff. So hopefully now we have a good idea of how customized extensions work and the many use cases that we can have for them. 
but you might still have some questions about why you should build a formal extension this way. After all, the fact that Customize deals strictly in Kubernetes data means that it is easy to pipeline it with other tools. And in some cases, it might be easier to write a script than to build a formal extension. And maybe that makes sense as an option sometimes. But building the functionality as a customized extension has many benefits. Most of these come from the fact that extensions so follow so exactly in the footsteps of core customized features, as we were just seeing. This means that the users of your extension will retain customized properties that they know and love. That is, they retain a purely declarative configuration that is fully encapsulated by their customization directly, directory, and they can use the familiar customized resource model exclusively in making their edits. They also are not exposed to any templating and have no new language to learn on their part. Another awesome property of customized extensions is that they're based on an open standard, which means that if you build an extension for customize, it's also gonna work in some other client-side configuration tools such as kept. We're gonna talk about that more later. Since we've been describing this extension format as client-side custom resources, another thing that might come to mind for you is the question of when you use the client-side uh, custom resource pattern versus the server-side, traditional server-side custom resources. How do you decide? Well, there are many benefits to moving more of your configuration management to the client side, and therefore earlier in your software development lifecycle. A really obvious one is that client-side custom resources naturally do not require you to install anything in your clusters, which can be a huge benefit, especially in some multi-tenant situations where CRD installation might be not desired or not even possible. From an abstraction designer perspective, there's also an advantage to the fact that the end user retains control over the final result. Specifically, the client-side version of this pattern is perfect for situations where you have an abstraction that you're concerned might become leaky over time. For example, imagine you're designing an app abstraction that wraps a deployment in some best practices for your organization. If you do it on the client side, your end users are going to be able to use the familiar language of Customize to modify the deployment, uh, arbitrary fields of that deployment even, after you generate it. And you don't, have to require, you don't have to expose any additional fields to let them make those arbitrary modifications. So your abstraction stays tight, and yet they get the power to modify whatever they need. Related to that, uh, once you have the results of your extension and the modifications that your end users make, all of that is going to still end up as YAML in your source control, if you're using GitOps best practices, of course. This provides greater auditability and change management, change management capabilities than the server-side implementation of the same thing would. And then finally, the fact that we're fully finalizing our configuration on the client side also means that any problems with it can be surfaced earlier in the development lifecycle. That is to say, they can be surfaced even before commit, or maybe in CI. So that sounds great, right? Let's shift everything to the client. Well. <laughs> No, there are many use cases for server-side custom resources that are really not suitable for be being ported to the client side. Notably, server-side custom resources should be completely side effect free, which means that they can only be used for abstractions that simply resolve to a set of resources. For example, let's say you're designing a custom resource that's going to cause a database to be configured in a third-party cloud somewhere. Well, that is an enormous side effect and it should definitely not be happening from a client side CR. Also, um, although customized extensions are a really great way to validate Kubernetes resources, they're generally not suitable for doing any sort of enforcement of either policies or standards, because as we were just mentioning in the benefits section, the flip side um, of giving your users a control over the final modifications is that they're always able to do that. So uh, you don't actually have full control in typical workflows again over the final result after your extension runs. And then finally, you need to keep in mind when you're building an extension that using extensions is going to add dependencies to your customized build. And that's really important to, to keep in mind, especially if you're not already committing the results of the build to Git. So now we understand how extensions work and what they're good for. So let's have a look at what it's like to build one. First, uh, an important note about extensions and customize. The type of extension that we're talking about today isn't actually the only one that Customize currently supports. It's the one that we recommend, though. Customize actually has five different types of extensions, all of which have been in alpha for quite some time. First, we had a format for extensions that could be written as binaries or as Go plugins, and they had to be installed imperatively by each end user. 
Then came a newer format uh, that followed something called the KRM function specification. This is actually the open specification that I was mentioning earlier. It's shared with other configuration management tools, such as KETS, and this gives your extensions written in this format more reach. The newer format currently supports authoring as binaries in Starlark or as containers. So this year, we had a look at all of this. We decided that extensions are really important, and we really want to graduate them out of alpha. But having these various ways of doing things, having to maintain all of this, it's really not sustainable, and it's pretty confusing. So we have a proposal open that deprecates the legacy plugin styles and promotes the style that follows that newer specification. For the time being, we recommend that you build containerized KRM functions specifically, uh, because Starlark is also proposed for deprecation, and exec might undergo more small changes as, as part of the progression to stable, uh, whereas containerized functions we're expecting to graduate uh, in a fairly consistent state to the way they are now. If you're curious about the details of these plans, please check out the caps that we have open. We're going to include these links again at the end of the slides, and our slides are also available in the conference schedule, so don't worry about copying it down. So as I was just saying to recap the recommendation, uh, we're highly encouraging extension authors who are getting started today to be, build containerized KRM functions specifically. And if you know Go, there is an easy way to do this. As part of Customize, uh, there is a package called KYAML, and uh, it has a function framework package uh, that can be used to help you easily author extensions. So we're gonna, look through, uh, we're gonna walk through some examples of how to use that today. Let's get started with an example where we're gonna build a transformer that does something really simple. What it's gonna do is add a single annotation that has a static key and a user controlled value. So in other words, we're determining what the key is, the user is giving us the value, that's all they get to do. And we're gonna insert that annotation into all the resources they give us. Simple. So in our customization, we wanna write something like this. This is what the end user should get to write. As you can see, we have a transformer configuration. It has its own kind, the value annotator, and we're using an API version that is unique to our company. In the transformer configuration, the user is going to be supplying our extension with that very important data that they want us to put in the annotation. So to understand what this extension is going to need to do, we're gonna first take a step back and uh, review what's going to happen to this configuration when Customize finds it as part of running the Customize build. So going back to what we learned earlier in the presentation, Customize is essentially a series of generators that are gonna feed their data into a pipeline of transformers. And within that pipeline, uh, everything is configured with KRM YAML. Inside the transformer pipeline itself, the output of each transformer in turn is passed to the, uh, to the next one in the line as the input. And then finally, we get our, our final YAML result. So in this case here, we're making a transformer, which means Customize is going to find that configuration we're writing in that transformers field. But then what is it gonna do? How will it know where to find the code we're writing? Turns out that con transformer configuration I showed you previously was missing something super important. The part that points customized to the implementation we're about to build. Currently, this is actually done with our annotation on the custom resource. The one of the open caps that I mentioned earlier proposes a way to remove this concern from the end user, which would be really nice. For now though, this is what the end user configuration is actually going to look like. As you can see, there's a direct reference in there to a Docker container that we're going to build. And uh, when Customize gets to this step in this Transformers pipeline, it's gonna be able to read that annotation and say, oh, I know where to find the, uh, the implementation for this value annotator type, and it's gonna go get your Docker container and execute it. It's going to specifically pass the resources that has accumulated so far from that pipeline that we're looking at uh, to the Docker container in a really specific format that we're gonna take a look at next. So that input format is a Kubernetes resource model API, of course, because everything customized is, and it's called a resource list. This resource list is gonna be passed to the extension on standard in, and it looks, it looks like this. It's got two fields that we care about today. And these fields are determined, by the way, by that KRM function specification that I keep mentioning. So the first field that we're interested in is the items field. Items simply contains that list of resources that we've accumulated so far, and that's, in other words, the resources that we need to process in our extension. The second part is called the function config field, and the content there probably looks pretty familiar by now. It's that same client-side custom resource that we're using to define our extension's configuration. 
has coming straight to us from that transformers field and the customization. It turns out that resource list is actually both the input and the output format required by the Karen function specification. So when we receive that input on the left in the form of a resource list, we're going to need to do our extensions work, and then we're going to need to output a resource list as our result. So specifically what we're going to do here, in this example, we're uh, receiving a config map uh, as the, in the items list, and our job is to add an annotation. So we're going to go look in the function config, we're going to see the important data that we need to put on as the annotation, we're going to put that onto our config map, and then we're going to write the transform config map into the items list, uh, the items field of the resource list. And finally, we're going to output that resource list on standard out to get it back to customize. So, would you actually implement this? No, no way. Customize has a really powerful annotation feature built right in, so you wouldn't bother doing this. The purpose of this example is to just get started with showing how easy it is to reproduce simple customized style transformations using the KML SDK. So let's take a look at that. This here is the code. Uh, the entire implementation of the simple extension fits in just 26 lines of Go. Let's zoom in on the interesting part. So the important thing to notice here is the signature of that function that we're implementing in the middle. It takes the list of items that we're getting from the resource list. So the framework itself is going to uh, take them out of the resource list that received as input, reading from standard in, and pass it to our function here, items field. Then we're going to do the work that we want to do in, in the body of the function, and we have to return those items. And again, the framework is going to take care of taking those items that we give it and writing them into a resource list, outputting them on standard out as required by the uh, specification. The other thing I wanted to point out about this example is the pipe E and set annotation helpers. CAMEL has a lot of stuff like this uh, that helps you do simple YAML manipulations for common transformations that you might want to implement. Now let's move on to a more advanced use case. Here, we're imagining that we're a platform maintainer and we want to promote our company's best practices for Spring Boot applications. We also want to avoid having to teach our end users how to wire up Ingress for their apps. So what we decided to do is create a client-side custom resource for use in Customize. It's going to be a customized extension. Notice that we're going to be asking the user to give us two inputs in this case. The image that's containing their code, plus the domain that they want us to expose their application at. In all likelihood, a real implementation of this would have a bunch more options, but to keep it simple, we're just going to go with these fields. Let's start once again by looking at the input and the output specification required um, by the KRM function specification. So we have a resource list, of course, on both sides. But in this example, we see the uh, client-side res custom resource that we just looked at from our customization. So now it's the Spring Boot app. And then we're going to work with an empty items in this case. Because if you think about what we're doing here, we're not transforming anymore. This time, we're a generator. So if you look at the uh, output that we need to create, we have some items on our items list. Specifically, we've got a deployment, a service, an ingress, a network policy. We're going to have to generate those from scratch, and we're going to have to make sure they're all wired up together the way the user asked us for. So the first thing that we're going to do to implement something more uh, sophisticated like this is define a type in Go that corresponds to that custom resource that we're exposing. As you can see, this type is going to have standard metadata inspect fields that you would think a uh, custom uh, cus uh, Kubernetes object would have. And we have a spec that actually has three fields. So we see the domain and image fields that we uh, looked at earlier in the uh, end user uh, configuration example. But we also have a replicas field here. We're going to implement that one as being optional. So you're going to see how that's easy to do as well. Since this struct is going to be populated from YAML, you'll also notice a bunch of YAML tags here, and that's going to be really important to remember. The next thing that we're going to need to do is implement a filter method on that type that has that same signature that we were just looking at in the basic example. It's going to take in a list of items coming from the resource list. We're going to do whatever we need to do to those items. Then we're going to return the resulting items and or an error as applicable. The framework is once again going to take care of reading for standard in from us. And it's going to call this filter function on our type. And it's going to take the items we give it, put it back into a resource list, emit it to standard out. CAMEL actually has a variety of tools to help you implement the business logic of your function as well. Earlier, we saw some simple helpers that help you manipulate individual nodes, like by adding annotations, like we're doing in the simple example. 
But we also have some higher level tools here, such as the template processor that we're using in this example. Here what we're doing is we're creating a bunch of templates for all of those many resources that we need to generate, and we're putting them into an embedded directory. Then we're using the abstraction type itself, so that uh, v1 alpha 1 Java Spring Boot, we're using that directly as template data. Template, template processor type actually also has a bunch of other interesting features that we're not showing here, including the ability to select subsets of resources and apply patches to them, which is a super handy operation. Another thing that we might want to do, especially because, as I just said in this example, we're using the user input as template data, is validate that input before we actually run our filter. Luckily, the framework makes this super easy to do as well. All you need to do is implement this validate method, and the framework is going to automatically call it before it calls your filter. Then, uh, we might also want to implement defaulting, and this is gonna, how we're going to make that replicas field optional. So the end user in the example didn't give us any replicas field, uh, and we're going to implement this default method that detects that and sets it to three for us. So this is also going to be called automatically by the framework before filter is called. The framework even helps you make your custom resource API sustainable by versioning it over time. This version API processor type that we're showing here essentially wraps related implementations and acts as a dispatcher based on API version and kind. The framework has even more tools than we have time to show off today. Notably, it supports patching, including for CRDs and at the container level, which can help you do a bunch of really handy operations. It also has a suite of selector and matcher tools that can help you target exactly the resources that you want. It can even help you kickstart containerization by generating your Docker file. So now that we've seen an example of how to build uh, extensions, I'm gonna pass it back to Jeff to discuss some best practices that you should keep in mind when authoring for Customize. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, best practices. Uh, first, keep your uh, extensions declarative. The whole thing about customize is to keep everything declarative. So nothing should depend on flags, nothing should depend on environment variables or any kind of outside resource uh, or to the extent that you can limit it. Um, the output should be deterministic. So think in terms of unit tests. If your input doesn't change, your output shouldn't change either. So uh, you want to have some predictable outcomes, right? Um, as Katrina just mentioned, leverage the API version. One of the reasons we want to use custom resources rather than inventing some other new way of doing this is to leverage all these concepts that we all know. So use the API version field to keep the, uh, your existing users of your extensions happy while you move into the future with maybe possibly breaking changes. And finally, uh, testing is important. Uh, anybody trying to get you to use a framework, the first question you should ask is, well, how do I test things? So this should be recognizable that anybody who's done Go unit testing. So if you're working in Go, and of course you can use any language you want because the, uh, the underlying format is a container. But if you're using Go, you can use this, where you see the word processor, just put in transformer or generator or whatever. And you can specify the inputs into that thing and specify the expected outputs. And you can also specify inputs that generate errors. So you can check that the errors are what you want. That's important for validators because that's the whole business in life is to report errors. Um, stepping back to the bigger picture, Customize is part of a CD uh, pipeline and it wants you to work with Git and we recommend using what's called a hydrated repository. So um, imagine you do a deployment, you run Customize Build and you're using all these extensions and now you're using containers in your pipeline. Uh, you've just introduced some risk. There's the usual risk, which we've all been bearing for many years now, pulling down the container from the internet. You mitigate that by using a trusted catalog, right? But the new risk is now you've got an extra piece that's running in your uh, CD pipeline and something could go wrong. So what you do is you put, uh, you run customized build, you put the output into a repository, usually with a robot, right? And then a robot also reads that repository on say a tag event and deploys it to the cluster. So now if something goes wrong, as the British would say, your cluster goes pairs up, pair up or pear shaped, I think. Um, you can do a rollback easily by just telling the robot, go apply the last tag. You don't have to worry about running customized build or going back to the original dry material, finding the tag you checked in, and then going rolling back to that tag and then running customized build again. 
Okay, so here's the link slide. Uh, and that's where Customize lives. There's extension documentation there. There is uh, uh, the KML live, um, framework that we were just talking about is listed there. There's some caps that are talking about future plans, um, especially the catalog, which is a, a cool project. There's a contributing file at the site. I would recommend anybody here who is interested in writing Go or contributing to Kubernetes in general to come take a look at the contributing file, look at issues that are marked help wanted. Turns out Customize has been a great place for many people to start working on Kubernetes. Um, lots of people started here even just writing documentation, and now they're doing releases, or now they are six CLI tech leads. So um, it's a good place to get started and, 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 and get involved with the six CLI. That's it. Right. Awesome. All right. Uh, thank you, Katrina and Jeff, for an amazing presentation. We are now have a few minutes uh, for your questions. Uh, so I actually have a few questions that uh, our users are asking online. Uh, first question from Daniel, uh, how, do you, how would we combine customize with Helm charts? Uh, is, is there any ways that uh, they can be you know, used together? Yes. You want to take that or should I take that? Sure, uh, yeah, I can take it. We, we have a built-in Helm generator function right now um, that you can use. It, it has evolved over time, uh, and the latest version of it requires you to set additional flags on the command line invocation of customize, but it, it works as a generator, so we, we talked about generators today. Um, part of that generator pipeline is just gonna read your, your Helm chart and send the results through to the next thing in the line. Um, another thing that you could do is you, if, if the built-in extension doesn't expose the Helm options that you want, you can build an extension, generator extension like we were talking about today that, that renders Helm. In fact, uh, the kept folks have created an extension uh, generator for Helm that follows the Karam function specification, so that's yet another option uh, that you can use uh, to, to, to bring those two tools together. Awesome. Uh, I think another question is very similar. Would it be possible to combine Go templating with Customize? No, I just got done saying that the, uh, one of the guiding principles is we're not going to do that. At least um, we want the raw material, the material, the configuration at rest to be just normal Kubernetes YAML, uh, no templates and no, uh, no design uh, domain specific language. I, I um, guess the caveat on that. The caveat, yeah, yes. the caveat on that was that uh, you might have noticed we had template processor in, as part of the extension guide there. So, uh, template. If you want to use templating, we recommend that you hide it behind a formal API, right? So you're defining your formal type. It has the fields. Your end users are working with pure Kubernetes data, like they would always with customize. But then within your extension, if you so choose, you can use templating in there, and you're not exposing it to your end users at that point. So uh, that's an implementation detail. Yes, you could write it in Perl if you wanted. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Uh, there's actually, I'm going to take last question from uh, virtual attendees, and then I will be asking uh, you. Um, but actually, I can answer that question. Would it be possible, um, what is it possible uh, the com compatibility you know, of uh, customized with tools like Argo CD or Flux. Um, so if you look into the documentation of Flux or Argo CD, there's actually uh, the whole chapter around how to use Customize. So uh, GitHub's tooling fully supporting right now um, the uh, Customize. So uh, any questions here? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, so I happen to have the sad task of maintaining the capability of installing manifests across a very large set of Kubernetes versions. So today I support all the way from 117 to like the head of master on KK. Does, is there any provisions for making it easier to like, uh, as a, for example, you know, certain APIs get deprecated and removed in later Kubernetes versions, new versions get added. Uh, it would be nice to have some capability to express that like, Hey, if it's like a 122 cluster, you can use this new API, but if it's not, use the old one or whatever, right? So. So you're talking about um, you've got m uh, multiple clusters running at different versions, and you would like to have customize manage that, or you'd have you maybe use is can customize be used to help you manage that? I don't want to have to like maintain distinct manifests for distinct Kubernetes API versions over time, right? I want to have the same manifest, but tweaked like 
it's the 116 cluster. So I have to use the, like the beta API for CRDs, not the V1 because it didn't yeah, exist I, yet. I mean, I may be wrong, but this sounds like a perfect use for variants. I mean, this is kind of customizes stock and trade. You figure out what you have in common between these different environments or these different versions, and that becomes your base. And then you use a different customization to modify those uh, modify your base to head off to your your various variants, head off to your uh, various versions. If you wanted to sort of abstract over the different like API changes for for some end users, say say, or if you wanted to use yourself, you could do that in an extension. Um, because extensions, one, one of the tools that we have allows you to select on, on different resources that exist in the source. So you could even theoretically um, identify that the input stream has the older API versions, and as part of your extension spec, you could you can include that cluster version. You could, in, like, in, inside your extension's business logic, you could look up, well, what, what API versions are supported here, and you could even do the conversion internally. Since you're writing a full program there, you can do essentially whatever whatever you would like. You just got to expose the data that you need to on, to form the basis of those decisions um, in in the API that 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 you're configuring, and then. Uh, and then you can take care of that within the extension. Um, and since you're you're writing a full program there, you, you can you can use the testing framework that we that we uh, were showing off there to make sure that it's going to behave as expected. Right now, there's no built-in API version modifier. So if, if all you were trying to do is like use like say a deployment at beta v1 or something, and you wanted to switch that to just v1, I, I don't think we have that. But it would be relatively straightforward to build such a thing. All right. Uh, thank you, Katrina, Jeff. Uh, we, we, we need to conclude our presentation because we are running out of the time. If you have any questions to speakers, please uh, reach out to them. Maybe you can talk at the booth. And thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the KubeCon.